Thanks for tuning in to episode two of Nightbeat Media's Living the Dream. Thanks for tuning in to episode two of Nightbeat Media's Living the Dream. Today, we are blessed in having as a, a guest on our show, Miss Julie Busby. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Now, tell us about yourself. Well, I um, wrote a book. It's called Running With Tears, Turning Your Pain Into Passion. So this is the book here. But um, I had a life-changing experience uh, back in 2009 And out of that, um, there was a lot of betrayals and just really a lot of pain. And so what I realized in my journey was that oftentimes people can end up in some very dark places that they never had any intention on going. And so out of this experience, I ended up starting a nonprofit, which is called Malachi. And it's based off of the scripture Malachi 4, 6, which says that God would return the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers or else a curse would come upon the land. And so the vision of Malachi is raising up leaders of a nation from unlikely places prison. So I've been doing that for the last four years down at Lebanon Correctional Institution, um, teaching them leadership skills, how to be fathers. But I just realized that a lot of these men that are in prison, they've had things that have happened to them. And what I tell them is oftentimes things happen to us in life that we have no choice about. So people betray us. Uh, Children get abused. Fathers walk out, they abandon them. Mothers get addicted or addicted to drugs. Um, These things happen to us that that wound us. And so out of that woundedness, um, if we don't heal from that, we, you know, you hear the saying, hurting people hurt people, which is true. And so what happens is things happen to us that we have no choice, but then we turn around and we hurt people. And so at that point, we have a choice about what we're doing, but we have to realize these things happen to us, go to the root of it, uh, find healing, and then find purpose out of that pain. And so that's what the book is really about, but it's, you know, turning your pain into passion. And so that's what I did. I took, you know, one of the most painful experiences in my life and said, okay, how can I turn this around and use this as a platform to become a, you know, a platform to my, my purpose and my greatest passion. And so that's what I'm passionate about is, is teaching these men that you can take the worst thing that's happened in your life and God can redeem you and restore you. So, okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. As I was reading mm-hmm. as far as mm-hmm. uh, your captions, as far as the right. uh, uh-huh. forward in your book, um, I was saying, wow, you went through quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as publishing your book, what were some of the speed bumps? Did you experience any Well, speed I self published. Um, I went through Create Space. So, anybody who is looking to self publish, I would recommend them. Um, it was, you know, the process was easy. Um, you, they have a, a template that will show you how to format your book. Um, but the main thing is what I tell people is writing the book is, is half of it, promoting it is the other half. So, you know, people say, oh, you know, you wrote a book. Okay, well, that's great. But if nobody knows about it, you know, you can have the best technology or invention in the world, but if nobody knows about it. So people have a tendency to think, oh, I wrote a book and now I'm done and it's just going to sell itself. That's not true. And, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of that myself, of not putting in the effort and work, which I've, I've, I've told myself I'm going to do this year, um, to, to really get on the ball of promoting it. But it's like anything, you know, it, it really comes from hard work and dedication and being persistent. Okay. So, now, mm-hmm. how long has your book been out? Um, I published it uh, the December before last, I believe. So, okay. So about a year or so, something like that. Okay. And now mm-hmm. it is on Amazon. It's on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Now, does Amazon help you as far as in your promotion? No, Amazon or? doesn't help you. I mean, it's on. It's print on demand, which makes it nice, and that's why I would recommend create space to people because. Okay. Somebody's in Africa, India, New York City, L.A. You're not shipping books to people. I mean, obviously, people have their own methods, the way they want to go about something, but it's convenient. So if somebody, you know, sees your book on social media, Facebook, they can order it and it's shipped directly to them. You're not, you know, storehousing all these books in your garage or, you know, spending thousands of dollars (laughs) begging for money on the streets so you can buy more books that now you've got to distribute. You're not selling them out of your trunk. Although, if that's what you want to do, hey, do it. (laughs) I'm not against it. (laughs) Okay. Now, so, <laughs> but in the um, far as part of, what are some of the things that you're doing to promote your? 
Uh, well, I've done, you know, just like I'm doing now, social media, um, you know, going to speak in different prisons, speaking engagements, okay. uh, different TV, radio shows and stuff like that. But like I said, I've not, I'm guilty. I've not done near enough as to what I do. But you have to treat it, you know, like I tell people who want to write, okay. um, you have to treat it like a job. It's like anything that you want to do, whether it's a business, whether it's a ministry, whether, um, you know, it's some goal that you have, you have to treat it like a job. You have to set time apart. And I think that's probably... Uh, one of people's biggest hangups is they treat it more like a hobby. And so, you know, if you have a goal in life and you decide, oh, I'm just I'm just going to, uh, you know, practice or, you know, tend to it when I feel like it, you know, you might get there somewhere before you die. But at that point, you'll be too old to enjoy it. So, you know, you really have to set time That's apart. True. And and just like you would at a job, you wouldn't be able to go hang out with your friend you know, at the mall or the coffee shop or whatever, you have to say, you know, put a, put a, a schedule aside, you know, whether it's um, all day on Saturday or it's an hour every evening or it's, you know, two hours um, at night or an hour in the morning, you've got to set aside time to do that. Mm-hmm. Why did you choose to write your book? Uh, I just felt like it was a story that had to be told. Um, I'm I'm just creative in nature, and writing has always been therapeutic to me. I tell people all the time, even if you're not, it's not something you want to do um, as far as a you know, career, but just have a journal. That I, mean, I tell the guys all the time in the prison, I said, writing is very therapeutic because you, you get what's in here out here. And so, I mean, and also people just kept telling me, they said, oh, my gosh, you need to write a book. And people would say, this sounds like one of those lifetime stories. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, it, it does. And so I just felt like we don't go through things just for us. So when you go through something that's life changing, you're obligated to share that experience with other people because there's other people who have gone through similar experiences. And not only that, but I find that it, it's healing for you. That it's 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 uh, reciprocal. When you give to other people, you do get something back. I've taken trips to Haiti, and what I tell people is, I probably got more out of that trip than what I gave because it's it's the experience. And that you know it was back in college when I went, so it's been some years ago. But even to this day, when I'm having a little self pity party or something like that, that experience I can look at it and say, Wow, I have something to be grateful for. Um, I can open my refrigerator and there's food. You know, I can I can I can drink clean water. Whereas down there, people are literally uh, sweeping dirt floors and and there's no refrigeration, so the meat has flies and those kind of things. So you know, it's it's about the experience and learning from that. And sharing it with other people. Your mm-hmm. prison ministry also. Um, that's byproduct of your book? Your Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So really the concept of running with tears, turn your pain and passion, is that, you know, oftentimes in life we look at people who we see as successful. And so we, we just assume it was easy. Like we, you hear the saying, the overnight success. And they're like, yeah, but it only took me 10 years. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So we see the longer. success, that's but we it. don't see the failures. And so me, I want to hear about people's failures. I mean, your success is great, and we can all applaud that, but I want to know how many times did you fall because the majority of of the process, when you climb a mountain, it's climbing. It's climbing. It's hard work. You know, it's it's late nights. It's... Um, it's, it's, it's pain. And so like I brought along this thing that I was, I was putting together today, but, um, it's called the seven P's and Ooh, okay. the seven P's of, of success is uh, purpose, passion, persistence, pain, perspective, payoff, and pride. And I, I can go through those in a second, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's really about learning that, there's there's hard work and there's dedication in it, but you have to also learn the process as well. You have to learn to enjoy the process of, of climbing that mountain and that hill. Okay. Have so. you gotten any feedback as far as from your book? Yeah, I've actually I've gotten a lot of great feedback. Um, I mean, just a lot of the guys, I, I take my book, I go into to the prisons, I speak uh, at men's prisons throughout, throughout the state. But I have uh, time and time again, and it's funny because... I remember when I first went into prison thinking, you know, why why am I going in here? And that's I'll tell you that story later. But I remember thinking, I don't have anything in common with these men. And why would I go into prison to speak? But what I find is that pain doesn't um, discriminate. So it doesn't discriminate between rich and poor. It doesn't discriminate between, uh, you know, black, white, Hispanic. It doesn't discriminate between, you know, what uh, language you speak or what zip code you live in. Uh, pain visits is all. And so pain is something that um, 
people really want to know. This is what I find when I go into prison. You see these guys, they're all tatted up. They got the grills on. And, you know, some people think they look all, all scary. But I'm like, when you really sit down with them, they have a lot of pain. And they're really just looking for somebody to say, you know, I understand your pain and to hear their story. And that's, I think, really what we're all looking for. We're looking for somebody, just just hear me, just listen to me. And so often things happen to us and we just tell people, oh, get over it. But the fact of the matter is we don't get over it. You know, we all know people that you meet 40 years later and they're still talking about this experience like it was yesterday. And you're like, right. you know, get over it. But <laughs> and so we visit that thing. It's just like if you had cancer, you wouldn't say just get over it. You have to get treatment. You have to get to the root of that. And what I find in our culture, we don't want to get to the root of it because it's messy and it's dirty. And we are an instant culture. You know, everything's instant. We right. instant gratification. email, we, we Skype, it. FaceTime, mm-hmm. all this. It's, it's this instant right. gratification. So what we want to do is, oh, take a pill for that. Right. And I was just talking to somebody, you know, today <laughs> about that, about how, you know, this woman, she was depressed and they were saying, oh, take medication. Well, the fact of the matter, her husband traveled a lot. He was gone all the time. And, and she told her friend, she said, well, pills don't cure loneliness. You know, oh, pills don't right. cure uh, abuse as a child. So, and I see it at the prison um, where, you know, a lot of these guys, they're on all this medication and they're doped up and they, they call it the pill mill. And so um, my thing is, you know, we, we can, and I think what we do is we, we throw pills at it because it gives us this sense of, oh, I, I helped you. I gave you a pill. It, okay. it, it you know, it, it, it eases our conscience to, to feel like we, we were doing something to help somebody in the situation. But the reason we don't want to really dig in, like I said, because fixing people it takes time and that's what we're gonna have to do if we want to fix people is we have to you know get to the root of these things we have to get our hands dirty you have to be willing to be in it for the long haul and so that's what i try to do to let these men know that you know i'm i'm not somebody that's coming here and that's leaving god has given me a vision and it was to to raise up leaders from unlikely places you know god always uses unlikely people uh do you do any other speaking engagements or yeah, I mean, I've I've done uh, lobbying for legislation, so okay. you know, spoke at the state house for senate. So I'm always open to speaking engagements because I love to talk. <laughs> so no, but I just it's my it's my natural inclination. Um, I tell people I'm happiest when I'm helping people. Okay. So my thing is, I heard TD Jake say something the other day. He said, if you uh, if you make enough uh, stupid decisions, you should eventually become wise. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I find that you know from my experiences and things that I've done were the mistakes that I've made that hopefully I can help somebody else not go down that same path or somebody that's already in it, the lessons that I've learned because I'm a very analytical person. So I, I'm, I'm constantly doing self-reflection. Um, even when people do something to me, I still feel that often we play a part in that. So the question you have to ask, maybe you were in a marriage or you in a relationship or a business uh, partner and the person betrayed you, deceived you or whatever, we have to, you know, ask ourselves those questions, you know, because I feel there's always red flags. There's always signs along the way that we tend to ignore. So, again, instead of playing that victim role and empowering the person um, or the problem, you know, take ownership of that and say, OK, why did I ignore these signs? Or what was it in me that would allow this person into my personal space? So we have to constantly self-reflect. So I'm constantly doing that. So um, I just like to share those experiences with other people so that hopefully they can learn that you can take a bad situation and and find something good out of it. That that's very mm-hmm. inspirational. Are you working on a second book? Um, I I do have a title for uh, a next book. Um, I haven't started writing it, but I know what it's going to be about, and it's uh, I believe it's going to be called uh, "When It Hurts to Hope." Okay. So it's about um, you know oftentimes people. The reason why they don't try is because they've they have failed. They have had disappointments. And it hurts to hope. It hurts to have hope. It hurts to have an expectation because when you have an expectation and when you try, there's always the possibility that you'll fail. And so what I find is oftentimes there's these, uh, you know, valley of dry bones, uh, as you would say, of people who there's a chapter in my book and it's called uh, Don't Die Between Pain and Purpose. And people have asked me, what's your favorite chapter? That's probably my favorite chapter because what I find is that oftentimes people die. They die between pain and purpose. Everybody loves to start something, and we all love to finish. But what happens in the in-between? 
Oh. You know, and I heard CD Jakes. I listen to him all the time. So, but he's one of my favorite people I listen to. So I'll be quoting him probably a lot. Okay. But he was saying that, you know, people say they love happy endings. And he said, but what makes a happy ending is, is the hateful middle. There's always a hateful middle. And he yes. said, that's the part that makes a happy ending. There's, there's the, the conflict. And so what I try to teach people is, you know, change your perspective on how you see the conflict. You know, your perspective is, is everything. And, you know, what is the difference between success and failure is perspective. If you're listening to this podcast, then you can, I don't know if you can tell (laughs) (laughs) that she has a lot of energy. You have a lot of passion about Mm -hmm. what, um, Mm -hmm. helping people, which is great. Um, Zig Ziglar had this uh, saying uh, that if you help enough people Mm -hmm. get what they want, then that fulfills you right there. So when you were talking about purpose, right uh, right here, you have me mm-hmm. sold. You have a definite yeah. purpose right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you had anyone contact you and say, okay, I read a passage mm-hmm. from your book and how it changed their life or mm-hmm. that it touched a nerve or it was reflective of a situation that they may have? Yeah. Um, so like I said, I was, I was, uh, I probably got distracted because I, I get off on all kinds of little rabbit trails. So, but, um, I was, you know, I was saying about the guys in the prison and some of the letters and, you know, when I'm in prison, they'll come up to me, Hey, I read your book, man. I read it in like two days and I stayed up all night reading it. But I had a guy, this was probably the most impactful letter I received. It was a guy who, um, had read a, my book and he was in prison. He's serving like a 40 year sentence, about 40 years. So, you know, pretty much, um, He's, it looks like he's not going to get out except for if, if God, yeah, doesn't get him out. But, um, he had a life sentence pretty much 40 years and his brother had got murdered some years ago. And it just so happened the guy who murdered his brother was in the same, ended up in the same prison as him. And he found out this was the guy who murdered his brother. So he said, I was planning on taking this guy out. He said, I had it all planned. The only question was, was it going to be uh dirty or clean, messy or clean? And he said, you know, I started befriending him, telling him, hey, you should try to get over on our block. You know, we'll look out for you. He says, so I had everything in place. I got him over to my block. He says, and then I got a copy of your book. And so essentially my book is about, um, you know, there was this great betrayal by my husband. He ended up uh, conspiring to have me put in a, a psych ward. And in the psych ward, they threatened me with electric shock, um, ended up getting out. Uh, there was a whole series of things that happened through, you know, manipulation that he did. But I would later find out that he was uh, having an affair with the health official who put me in there um, into the the psych ward. And then when I got out, he ended up getting a restraining order on me, um, took my children away. It was just, it was, it was very, very um, painful experience. So, you know, there was a lot of anger and rage and hatred that I had, but God ended up dealing with me to forgive him and forgive all the other people that had betrayed me in this experience And so my book is really about, you know, not only turning your pain into passion and purpose, but it's about forgiveness and it's about redemption that, you know, God redeems people, redeems those of us who have been hurt and he redeems those who are doing the hurting Mm -hmm. because that's who he is. But he uh, read my book and he said, man, he says, Julie, that book really convicted me. He said, I realized that God does have a purpose and a plan for my life. And this was really just Satan trying to get me to destroy my life. And he said, I got convicted that I needed to forgive this guy. He said, so I ended up not only forgiving the guy, he said, but God touched my heart so much to, because the guy's very intelligent, very intelligent guy. You'd be amazed at, you know, the talent that's in prison. But he ended up, he said, you know, he was a, a tutor in, um, in, in, in the prison. He said, God ended up touching my heart to end up mentoring this guy, kind of take him under my wing as like a little brother. So that was probably, it, it made me realize that, this was more than just a book. It was, it was for some people a saving grace. Like people need to hear this message. And that's why I say everybody, like you said, when we came in here today, everybody has a story. Tell your story. It'll help somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's um, one of the things. And it's, we were discussing earlier that a lot of times you don't hear those stories or when, Mm -hmm. Someone hears a story that's uh, mirroring pretty much right. their own mm-hmm. situation right there. Uh, sometimes people hold it back, saying that, for instance, everything that you went through, uh, I'm not going to put it in paper. I'm not going mm-hmm. to document it. I'm going to hold that to myself right there. Um, where you know, 
by doing that, it kind of hurts someone that could benefit from it. Right, right exactly. There. Yeah. And as you mentioned, also, it's it's kind of therapeutic when mm-hmm. you're able for us to, hey, let me put it out there so I can see it. Uh, even though it's painful, it is what it is. And by doing that, I can move on. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's what I find. I find every time I go into the prison, I go in there. I'm in there twice a week. I go in every Thursday. I teach a class on leadership. And I go in on Sundays. We have a running group down there. But just the the comments and the feedback. And I don't know how many times, you know, because anytime you start something, um, it's it's not going to be easy. If you start a business Mm -hmm. or, you know, start writing a book or you want to do a film Mm -hmm. or whatever you're doing, there's there's all kinds of bumps and opposition. You're going to feel like quitting. And there was times I would feel like quitting and then I would get a letter, you know, just like that from a guy saying, man, you, you changed my life. I had gotten a letter from one guy. He was this amazingly gifted, uh, spoken word artist. I mean, he literally, his mind just never stopped. And so he would come into class and he, you know, would share some of these poems. And so I started encouraging him to go up in front of the the classroom and perform them and, you know, would just uh, try to boost his confidence and telling him, you know, what a talent he had and encouraging him to, you know, voice projection, all these things. Well, he ended up getting transferred to another uh, prison and he wrote me and he was only in my class for like six months. And he said, I wanted, he said, I never told you this, but I wanted to thank you. He said, you've been my greatest encouragement. He said, in the time I was in your class, he said, I wrote 600 poems. I mean, 600 poems, this guy was just, I mean, literally he just, he would just, I mean, just write, 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 write. But he said, I got a hundred of them copyrighted. And he wrote me the day and he said they uh, have filmed it. They did a a um, production up at his prison, like spoken word, rap. And okay. he's like, I performed my, my, my uh, poems. He's like, and they filmed it. And he's like, I wanted to send it to, he was, he's like, I was going to send it to my mom, but he's like, I want to send it to you instead. He's like, can I send it to you? And I was like, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But it's teaching people because it's an outlet, you know, uh, creativity is an outlet. The Creative arts. Therapy. Yeah. If you look at some of your favorite songs, you know, um, Eminem, some of his songs came from mm-hmm. pain. You know, a lot of the rappers, it came from pain. Look at Kesha's praying. If you're familiar with her song, um, for those who are not, um, she was, it's, she was raped. And so it was about her stories about, uh, this rape that occurred and she was on a talk show and they had asked her about the song and she kind of started tearing up. But she said, this album literally saved my life. And that's what I find that for, you know, to get your story out there, there's something healing about it. So when I hear this feedback from the guys, it's healing to me. And it's like pieces of me come back. So we lose things, you know, pieces of ourselves in life. And, and we need to learn how do I, how do I get back my identity? How do I, how do I find myself? How do I find my purpose? And what I find is you, you find your purpose in helping people. Like it's all about people. If we don't make it about people, what are, what are we doing here? Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. is one of the things that you didn't anticipate um, on finding that, that you found out when you became a uh, author? One of the things I didn't anticipate? Yes. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say there wasn't, I, I can't say there, I, there was something I didn't anticipate. I think uh, really, you know, the thing that I've learned is, that you have to be consistent. So that's one of my, my seven P's is persistence is that, you know, I used to teach aerobics and you would see people, uh, new year's, everyone's in their new year's resolutions and you'd see these people and they're in there and they're out of shape and hey, they're working out like two, three hours a day. And you're like, that seems a bit much, a bit extreme. And then after two weeks they're, they quit because they they don't have consistency. They're not persistent. And so what I found is that you have to be persistent. So every day, weekly, You've got to stay on that schedule to, to like I said, promote and market your book because you can write it, but it's not going to sell itself. I mean, if you get that lucky break, you get on Oprah's book club. Hey, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> but again, I'm sure before they got to Oprah, they were making hundreds and, and thousands of calls and emails and, you know, 95% of those weren't returning their calls or inviting them to be on their show. But it was, you know, you never know. Uh, where you might get your breakthrough, you know, somebody listening, it may not be a huge uh, listenership, huge audience, but somebody's listening and then that person gets you here and there. It's kind of like dominoes, like connect the dots. Mm -hmm. So that's amazing that you Mm -hmm. had mentioned that. And that's one of the things Mm -hmm. that um, we have often said, and that is that it's important to tell your story, to get it out Mm -hmm. there, 
because you never know who is listening. Exactly. Um, um, Dr. Oz is by sharing your story and being able to mm-hmm. help someone. Exactly. Now, That's, yeah, go ahead. Now, where do you see yourself going Where forward? do I see myself? Um, well, I'm currently, I'm, I'm doing a revision. Uh, I have a, I've written a script based off of my book. So I'm uh, working on uh, connecting with somebody to get that uh, directed and produced. So I'm hoping to turn that into a film. And so my goal is to be able to um, be self-sustaining. So hopefully through... Uh, the doors that will open there through film production and, like I said, if I can I discipline myself to market the way I need to with my book. But getting just platforms to 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 work in media and communications, I'm just um, I'm naturally a, just a communicator. So I like to communicate. I, li- I like to talk. I like to connect with people. But using that as a platform to get more speaking engagements to bring awareness to what uh, my passion really is about redeeming uh, men and fathers, because, like I said, everything's about people and you know, like I tell people all the time, I said, you know, sometimes we're chasing after these elusive things. It's almost like a mirage. You know, you're chasing after success. You're chasing after money. But what I tell people, and, and hopefully this gives them kind of a visual, I said, imagine you've been training your entire life uh, for a race. I said, and you finally get to the Olympics. I said, and the the gun goes off. You take off out the blocks. I said, and you run the race of your life. You not only beat your personal record, but you make the world record. You've won the gold medal. Mm -hmm. I said, and you look up in the stands, and it's empty. Nobody's there. Does that have any meaning? No. No. You know, if you become rich and you obtain all this, you know, success, and you're living in a 20,000-square-foot mansion, and there's nobody there, there's nobody to share these uh, successes with, it doesn't mean anything. There's a book uh, Damon John uh, from the Shark Tank was promoting it on uh, LinkedIn, but um, I believe it's called The Mask of Masculinity. Have you heard of it? Uh, I don't even know who no, he is. He's, no, I, he no. was a pro ball player. I want to say his okay. last name is Lowe's. But anyway, it looked really good. But he was sharing his story, and he was saying how there's this mask of uh, masculinity that men hide behind. And he was saying it, at five years old, he was raped by a man. And he said it affected his whole life. And so out of that, he never told anybody. So he was always trying to prove himself. And he said he tried to do it through sports, becoming, you know, successful. He said, and then he had an injury where he couldn't play anymore. And now it was like, oh, where's my identity at? Then he tried to do it in in um, business. He said, but I was always empty. And so that's what I find is that we have a society of empty people because we're not building relationships. We're not building intimacy. We were designed for intimacy. So that's what I tell people. You know, it starts with your purpose. What is your purpose? What is your why? Why am I doing this? In some form or fashion, it should be to help people. Whether you're creating an invention, oh, it's to help people. You wrote a book, it's to help people. Um, you open a Chick-fil-A, it's to help people. You're, you're, it's a service industry, you know. My kids love Chick-fil-A. So. But, you know, and, and even in that, you know, you don't have to be a speaker. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be that. But what do you... You know, are you bringing joy to somebody? Are you bringing happiness to somebody? How do you treat the people that, you know, somebody's coming in and they're ordering a little Chick-fil-A meal? You really don't know what just happened to this person a week ago. You know, their husband could have walked out. They could have lost a child. Just that little bit of kindness and smile to that person. So everything you do, your purpose, your why, that's Mm -hmm. what's going to keep you going. But in some form or fashion, it has to be around people because outside of people, like, really, what are we doing here? Right. You know, what are we doing here? <laughs> right. So uh, that reminds me of a uh, quote, mm-hmm. and that was that everyone you meet is facing or fighting some bad. Exactly. And you never know what battle exactly. that they're fighting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My bishop always says you're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or you're going into a storm. So, <laughs> you know, and that's another one of my P's. I was like, it's, it's perspective. <laughs> it's really. You know, how do you, how do you, you view this? You know, you hear the cliche, is the glass half full or half empty? But it's really, really true. And something I've really been trying to focus on is, is that very uh, essence perspective and being in the present. You know, I I remember um, years ago, I had went uh, with somebody to an AA meeting. No, I wasn't an alcoholic. I don't remember why I was there, but they invited me. And (laughs) so one of the things a guy said that stuck out, he said, I had one foot in the past one foot in the future, and I was pissing on the present. And how many of us do that? We're not present. Look at all the people on their smartphones. You know, I'll go out, and there's a dinner table, and everybody, there'll be five or six people, and they're all on their smartphones. You know, I was running down by the river uh, the other other day, and 
there was a man and a little child, he was with his child, and he's on his smartphone. I'm thinking, wow, it's a beautiful day out. You're down by the river. You can be playing, laughing, joking. But we do that, whether it's distractions, whether, you know, it's uh, our, we're, we're there, but we're, we're not mm-hmm. mentally. And I'm guilty of doing that. You know, I'm you know, thinking about all the things I have to do or maybe a situation that has occurred that I'm frustrated or upset about, and I'm not in the present. And so I'm like, how many of us are missing this moment, this this present? Like they say, they call the past the past and the the future the future, but today is called the present because it's a gift. Yes. You, do, you, you don't get a redo from yesterday and get, you know, tomorrow's not guaranteed. What are you doing with the present? So while you're climbing the mountain to get to your purpose, and it's great to, you know, uh, aspire to something higher and try to obtain something, but what I find that the catch is, are you enjoying the journey? Because the, the, the majority of the mountain is spent climbing. You get up there. It's a beautiful view. This is awesome. But those peaks are few and far between. So if you don't learn how to enjoy the process, you're going to get there to where you think success is. And it's not going to look like what you think because, you know, there's another problem, like we said. And so if you don't have the right perspective, oh, I can have joy. I can have peace in the midst of the problem. It really, it, it's what my perspective is about it. You know, like my daughter, um, she's 14, and she had to do this uh, uh, speak in front of the class. And um, she was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And I was like, what's the worst thing that could happen? I was like, everybody will laugh at you and think you were terrible. Like, that's the worst that can happen. You know, like, <laughs> I heard something the other day. They said, uh, it was, a, it was a, like a little thing. It was, it was, it was failure talking. And, and it said, what if I fail? And then life said, we'll all laugh at you. You know, like you think about like in, imagine the worst case scenario and then go, oh, like will you die? Oh. No, life will go on. So face yes. your fears and go, okay, it's really not that bad. Like it's not that serious. Mm-hmm. So it's great talking. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <With> you. <laughs> oh, oh, listening to you. That that's what we're here for is mm-hmm. to help those who are out there, inspire those. I wouldn't be surprised if we listen to a a radio station or a podcast mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you had your own podcast. my own show, right? <laughs> your own show. Well, that's the goal. <laughs> uh-huh. mm-hmm. I know you have a pretty busy day mm-hmm. and we won't take any more of your time. We always like to ask what would you like the community to know? What would I like them to know? Um, the main thing I want them to know is that, um, real quick, if I can run down these, uh, purpose. Uh, this is your Yours. why. So why are you doing this? This is your mission statement. This is what's going to keep you going when when you want to quit. Uh, the second thing is passion. So would you do it for free? If you wouldn't do it for free, then it's probably something you shouldn't be doing because if you're starting a business um, or if you're starting a, a ministry, anything that, that, that you know, is, is, is jumping out of the pack of, of average and normal, um, you're going to feel like quitting. And so the, the passion is what's going to keep you going. And uh, the majority of people, when they start something, they're doing it for free. They're not getting paid. A lot of entrepreneurs, <laughs> they're working for free. <laughs> so you have to be passionate about what you're doing. Uh, persistence. I talked about this. I said quitting. Quitting cannot be an option. Um, there was a quote by Winston Churchill, one of my favorites. It says, never give in, never, 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 never. And so sometimes it literally is about outlasting. So, you know, you have an enemy um, working against you. Is can you outlast the enemy? Can you outlast the opposition? Can you outlast the, um, the problems that are going to come against you? Pain, um, the fourth P, it's inevitable. So the pains of disappointments, closed doors, rejection, a jealousy from people, people who you thought would support you. Oftentimes will be the ones that are your greatest opposition. So that creates pain. You have to learn how to overcome that. I was listening to something. They said the difference between an, a good athlete and an elite athlete is their in, uh, ability to endure pain. And so you have to be able to, to endure pain. And so uh, the fifth one is perspective. You know, what separates success from failure? Perspective. Um, you, you cannot be afraid to fail. You can't look at failure as an end all. There's a quote by Michael Jordan. It's one of my favorites. He says, uh, I've missed uh, 9,000 shots, lost almost 300 games. Yeah, yeah. 26 <laughs> times been awarded with the, the, uh, win gaming, uh, the, win, the winning game shots. Yes. And he says, I've missed. He said, I failed over and over again, and this is why I succeed. Uh, I just read something today about Bill Gates. He was a Harvard dropout and was a co-owner of a, of a failed business. He could have looked at that and said, you know what? You know, I guess I'm not meant to go into business. Michael Jordan could have said, oh, I was cut from the high school team. I guess I'm not supposed to. But it was his perspective about it. And so what I find is that 
uh, failure is really, it's a building block. It's a building block to strength. And it's a building block to have compassion for other people. You know, when you go through certain things, it gives you another perspective to be able to relate. It, it gives you a greater sphere of influence. And if you keep your perspective right, like I tell people, I said, you want to be a leader. I said, what is a leader? A leader is a problem solver. I said, so what are you, you going to have more of? Problems. I said, if you want to lead a few people, you have a few problems. If you want to lead a lot of people, I said, you're going to have a lot of problems. So it's how you choose to look at it. Problems are often opportunities uh, for success. So if you could solve a problem, guess what? Who are they going to? The problem solver. So, and then uh, the last two things are payoff and pride. And so you have to realize that there is a reward uh, for your faithfulness. So if you put in the hard work and the dedication, there's going to be a payoff. So when things are difficult, you have to keep your mind on that finish line, that there's a payoff coming for this. And that's why a lot of people never get the payoff is because they can't endure the pain and the process. And then the last P is pride. So you, we all know before a great fall uh, comes pride. So when you get to the payoff, when you get to the the, the place of, of purpose and you're like, oh, man, I finally made it. Don't forget where you came from. Remain humble. Uh, remain in a place of humility. Be pliable to be used. Don't think you know it all. Um, you can always learn from other people, even though you're up here. You can learn from the people down here. And remember, like I said, it's all about people. So when you get there, don't get so prideful that, oh, it's, it's about me. No, it always was about the people. And that's why when you start with a purpose, it has to begin with people. It begins with people and it ends with people. So that would be my, my advice for the seven Ps. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, it's been our pleasure. Yeah. And for those who are out there listening to this or if you're watching this on YouTube, again, we want to hear your story. We would like to thank our guest, Julie Busby, for sharing those inspirational words and her story with us. Also, for all of our listeners out there, remember, each one teach one. Mentoring is the key to the future, and we hope you are living your dream. Also, we want to hear your story. If you have not subscribed, please do so. We hope to share other inspirational entrepreneurial stories. It could even be yours. Remember, subscribe and check out our next podcast. Thank you and have a wonderful life.